This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. And with me today, he was just bad mouthing women. It's Hans. One in specific. Not bad mouthing, I just think she's boring. And uh, the whole online persona thing, it's, uh, I don't understand the appeal, but it's not, you know, not in general. Just, just one person that we might mention in the middle of this episode or not. I think so. I think it'll definitely come up. Uh, you were just talking about an older woman who loves Riverdale and does a podcast with her dad. How wholesome. That's cool. Very cool to talk about Riverdale. Now, what would this have to do with the 10 best movies of 2023? Who knows? Who knows how it'll tie in? But it is our 10 best films of 2023 special, and people have been looking forward to this. I've been asked about it several times. When are you guys doing it? When are you dropping it? I've said, just wait a little bit. Just hold off. We have a couple of films we desperately need Hans to take a look at before those lists can be finalized. And I did see you saw Oppenheimer finally, so we're going to have some heavy hitters probably on your list that you've watched at least. I don't know about top five. Yeah, I watched quite a few films this week as well to make sure that my list was pretty well-rounded, and I feel like I did get everything I wanted to see in time with the exception of Poor Things. So Poor Things will not be on my list for the year. I haven't seen it. I typically like Yorgos Lanthimos, but it is not going to be on my list for right now. Maybe I'll issue a revision when we wind up doing another themed episode, which will be the best films watched in 2023. We did this, I think, the last two years, maybe. And it essentially works the same way as best films of 2023 countdown lists that we release, except it's the best films watched within that year. It could be from any year. It could be from 1922. Yeah, I have a very old, a couple of very old ones in my list, actually. How? What is the oldest? Talked about Caligula. Well, oh yeah, from well, that was last year. Was that last year? Yeah, Caligula was my number one last well, year. Well, aren't I glad that we're not doing that episode? Today? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, never mind. Uh, yeah. The, I meant I meant by year anyway. Be. I don't want to spoil the list. People are if, 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 yeah. first of all also. Go sign up at patreon.com slash low res in the $5 tier because that is exclusively where you're going to be able to find that episode. We're going to be counting them down. This one, all the video episodes, exclusive to patreon.com slash low res. So if you're listening to it in the feed on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, there is always a video companion along with that. You have to sign up, help Hans get paid. And pretty soon we're going to be making the Discord patrons only as well. We have about, what, 300, 400 people on Discord, I want to say. We're going to start capping that for people who sign up in the $5 tier because we got to make some more money with this program. The views and the listens are going up, 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 but the money needs to come in a little more reliably. And unless you want to hear me plugging away for, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say, I don't want to say Blue Chew. That's the obvious one from 2018. But what's a, what's a, what's a good ad you hear on podcasts these days? Uh, better help. Better help. <laughs> Remember that was a big old scandal. People were like, "Can you believe Philip DeFranco's plugging Better Help? These are nobody's. Behind, these are Indians behind the computer playing therapist, and they made a whole scandal of it. And now you listen to like the official White House broadcast of the day is brought to you by BetterHelp.com. You see it on like real things, on professional things. Nobody cares. Don't ever listen to these YouTubers talk about grifts and scams. They're just speaking out of jail. And it really actually annoys me whenever I do see some 40-year-old failed YouTuber talking about, look at the latest grift, Charlie Kirk's grift, Ben Shapiro. It's like you're doing the same fucking thing. If you're on X, if you're on any of these platforms and you're trying to sell yourself, guess what, pal? You are a grifter as well. It means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Yep. <laughs> Hans, why did you copy me with the beanie tonight? Yeah, it's uh, I mean, we can. I, you want to take it off? I can take it off. I don't mind. We can take it off. We can take beanies off, masks off. Nah, yeah. I think it's all right. Yeah, I, don't, I think it's okay. I don't tonight. have anything. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't have an issue with my hair. There's no hair, so I don't know. Well, just... it, it has a very. I think your beanie is more the last detail. My beanie is more. I just got out of a uh, concert in a warehouse yeah your, yours is more avery levine music video mine is a uh, homeless man that uh has cancer on the street i was thinking more querelle you know 
I don't know what that is. That's all right. Are you going to build up the wall more? Are you going to do what I'm doing here yeah. eventually and, and build it? Yeah, I'm going to yeah. tear this down at some point and put something else. In. I'm trying to figure out what I'd like to do. And I'm leaning towards, actually, I don't want to talk about what I'm leaning towards on the show. I'll tell you after the show what I'm thinking here. I'm going to change this up, though. And, um, yeah, no, I mean, we should we should get into the list. Now, what have you watched in preparation for this show? Uh I started watching Napoleon and then I saw that it was two and a half hours today. And then I thought, well, I could just watch two 90 minutes movies instead of watching this, even though I was enjoying the first 20 minutes, which is what I saw. Um, but today was the first day when I was able to see finally a decent print, a decent copy of it, because even when you told me uh, they had not finished uploading it on the website. So that day it was not up yet mm. for me to be able to download it. Um, Two so and a half hours. I mean, you could have watched Abel yeah. Ganz's Napoleon in that time. Oof. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Is that one from like the 40s? It's from the 20s. <laughs> and it's a hell of a oh, lot okay. longer. Yeah. They needed three screens to show it. Oh, okay. Well, what if each screen would burn down after two hours what is the <laughs> is the joke there that it, the old theaters were unreliable or what yeah no you mean they were like what too long it was, yes like it, it was uh it, widescreen shooting hadn't been invented yet so they were like let's just get three cameras and we'll do one screen in the middle one screen on the left one screen on the right Ah, that sounds very james cameron of them <laughs> yeah 1920s. it kind of is i mean it really was visionary for the time but you 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 tried to get through napoleon napoleon was the latest film that i watched i watched that last night yeah uh and uh i started looking at some of the reviews and i i honestly saw there's a lot of negative uh, uh attached to it but then i started reading and most of it is just well this is inaccurate to history and it's like I, okay i don't so does that make it a bad movie does that make it an invalid movie because i really enjoyed blonde and that's supposed to be like a a, a story off a person that didn't actually happen but is presented as a biopic i still enjoyed it so i don't understand that backlash of hey it's not what actually happened because it's like it's still a fucking movie like it's not a documentary that you're watching right and most of the negative reviews mention that. And it's like, I don't care. I still want to see it. It's Joaquin and, and what's his name directing it. The fact also, it blew my mind to find out that Ridley Scott is 86 years old. He is not in the conversation of old directors like, wow, this could be his last film any day now. Michael Mann, they're basically talking like Heat 2 is his final go. Martin Scorsese, we're all just waiting for him to die. He's play, yeah. He's got a Jesus movie he's planning for this year. That's going to be 80 minutes long, which is the briefest Martin Scorsese film in about 15 fucking years. But nobody speaks of Ridley Scott like he's going to be dead soon. And you certainly don't get the vibe of this movie or The Last Duel or even House of Gucci that the director is a geriatric who's almost 90 years old. It's really impressive to me. Yeah. I wonder, I would like to see it behind the scenes just to see if it's one of those directors that just are sitting at a chair and barely move and is just directing everything from the chair, or if it's actually involved as a Friedkin would be in this last movie that I'm sure I'm going to mention, I'm sure you'll mention too, uh, but I can imagine him being just a, a ball of frenetic energy still till the end. Yeah. When Friedkin, when Friedkin was directing K-Mutiny Court Martial, he was definitely ill. He was definitely sick, but I think from what I've heard of all the set stories, he still did have all of that Friedkin energy you would you would know and recognize him by. But actually, K-Mutiny Court Martial didn't make my top 10. It actually, oh, okay. uh, it narrowly fell out. Now, I do have things in a ranked order between 11 and I think it's like 70. I watched about 70 movies that were released in 2023. Jeez. But it's not really a firm order. So here's just a couple of movies that missed out. That, that I'll give you. I'll give you twenty to, or I'll give you twenty-two to eleven, in no particular order. Maestro, number twenty-two, well-made film, not a favorite of mine. Bradley Cooper was very clearly inspired by Blonde, and that seems to be the new art film Netflix style of. We're going to swap aspect ratios and jump between black and white and color and do this and that. His performance is good, but it's not. 
I guess he was like get trying to get into the headspace of Leonard Bernstein for 15 years or 11 years, whatever, but leading up to this movie. And you don't get that. You really don't get that. Number 21 is Skinamarink, which I still think is a noble effort from the filmmaker. Sound of Freedom is 20, which was a hell of a lot better than what I was expecting. It wasn't one of these Daily Wire, My Son Hunter movies. You wouldn't even know it was right wing if people didn't make an effort to frame it as such. It just kind of feels like a standard action film. It reminded me of like a Sylvester Stallone movie from the 90s, if I'm being real. The Flash is 19. Barbie is 18. Uh, ah, hold on a second. Sorry, this is not a movie, but Copenhagen Cowboy I put in my 17th spot. That's how I started the year. We just did Ryan Jackson's show. Mm -hmm. I did an episode with him about a year ago this time on Copenhagen Cowboy. Check that out and check out our latest episode, Mutual Aberration Society. There was a Netflix documentary on Wham. I got that oh, yeah, at that 16. Good. Yeah, that was that was pretty mm -hmm. solid. The Killer, another Netflix movie. Very dumb movie, but fun. I haven't seen it. It's enjoyable. I, my review on Letterboxd was, it was like David Fincher directed a good John Wick sequel. And I think that's probably the most accurate. Or it also kind of felt a little Kojima. It felt Metal Gear, but 2004 Metal Gear, you know? Okay. Merry Little Batman is my number 14. <laughs> The Iron Claw, number 13. I really wish they included... Do you know anything about that The story, the backstory on the wrestling family? Yeah, yeah, the... What are the names? What's the brother's names? Uh, the Barrymore. Yeah, I'm a little familiar with, with how sad it is and how, yeah, they were supposed to be the next uh, wrestling family. And uh, they were for a little bit, but it ended horribly, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I, I heard that the Dark Side of the Ring documentary is really good about them those are usually very good even if you don't like wrestling oh yeah i haven't watched wrestling in like five ten years but uh yeah i heard that was very good i just haven't been able to find a, a decent copy that's not cam and i i i made that mistake with elvis and i don't want to do that again so i'd rather wait i think that's perfectly understandable i would not compare the movie to elvis i think will be quickly forgotten it's a solid a24 film i wish they had included the brother who did not have the right stuff to become a wrestler and killed himself as a result. Because you're already killing off four brothers or something like that already. What's a fifth? It's already ridiculous. Why not? Just be real. That's the honest, the honest truth of it. If I was a member of that family and they cut out my brother and they just acted like he never existed just because he wasn't a wrestler, I'd be pretty pissed. I'd be pretty annoyed with that. So that movie is number 13. I thought it was very good. The performances in it are stellar, you know, um, Jeremy Allen White is really having a moment. They're thinking about adding him to Heat 2 as young Al Pacino now. Uh, I don't know how I, I feel about uh, that, but it's not I, bad. I feel like he's he's all right. I He's definitely one of those it guys that, that every year, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of those that you wouldn't expect that come out of nowhere. I, don't, I haven't seen The Bear, which is apparently his biggest thing, right? Or the reason why he's he's gotten so big. Yep. I've heard good things about it, but I'm it's bad as chefs. It's, it's kind of not something that I the angry you know. badass chef with tattoos yeah. with sleeves up and down. It, it, it's kind of that show. It is kind of that show, but he's good. The the girl who's in bottoms, whose name is escaping me at the moment. She's also good on the. I mean, honestly, most of the Abo, cast is good. Abba Abo something Abo Abo. <laughs> oh, I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can show this episode in Australia now. Calling her an wow. abo. Isn't that her name? Like ab ab abo Banichiwi or something. Yeah, like that. yeah. I, I love her performance on the bear and in bottoms. She's great. She's wonderful. So that show is a lesser version of the Boiling Point show that's on. I think BBC. Did you see Boiling Point with Stephen Graham? No. That movie is a cool badass chefs uh he's kind of like that but he's not really like that he's he's a he's got problems and it's not played for like isn't he cool it's played for more okay. like damn this restaurant's about to fall apart this restaurant's about to go under and it's all done in one take and it's one actual take it's there's no cuts at all they did it like a play huh. and you can kind of tell at points because when they go outside of the restaurant it's dark and it doesn't have professional lighting then you come back 
they shot it, I guess, three times. And then COVID restrictions killed the production. And they were like, all right, I guess we just picked the best take of these three. And it's, I, I think it's a very good movie. The show is probably a bit better, but they they did the same thing that the This Is England series did, which is we can't afford Stephen Graham's salary for a full episode season. Um, I think we're going to have to downgrade his character. So that's a that's something to check out if anyone here enjoys The Bear. Go check out Boiling Point. It's a three or four episode series on BBC. Number 12 Bob is... Bear. That's yeah. what you were doing an SNL impression. I'm doing a Robbie Goodwin doing the <laughs> SNL guy from Chicago. Wow. Impression. That's a double deep cut. Uh, Bo is Afraid is number 12 for me. Ari Aster's latest outing. Very good performance from Joaquin in this movie. And boy, does he look terrible. I love that they utilize the dystopia that is San Francisco and accurately presented its homeless problem in the movie, which seems to have gone over a lot of people's heads. Number 11. Can I mention something about that? Because that's not on my, on my list. Very impressive that they were able to find someone that has this sad face, like Joaquin Phoenix's face, and it's an actual person. I thought it was like a CGI de-aging of Joaquin Phoenix, but the that boy. guy just actually... Yeah, that guy just actually kind of looks like what Joaquin Phoenix would look like at, I don't know, 12 or whatever. Uh, so that was cool. I honestly thought that it was just some weird de-aging CGI, but no, that's just his face. So, so that's cool. Well, this is news to me that that was not the case. Wow. Okay, yeah. Armin Nahapitin, He's uh, he seems like he's a foreign actor. Maybe he's Israeli or something. I don't know. He's done nothing of note besides Bo is Afraid, but boy, did he luck out having a face exactly like Joaquin Phoenix's. Good yeah. casting choice here. Dennis Michaud, who was in uh, one of the top 10 films I did last year, which was Peter Von Kant. It was a gender-swapped adaptation of Petra Von Kant, The Bitter Tears of Petra Von Kant for, by uh, uh, Fassbender. So he's very good in that. Nathan Lane, they brought Nathan Lane back randomly, Patty LuPon, um, and uh, Parker Posey. Richard Kind. Richard Kind as, as well. Yeah, very 90s cast yeah. for this movie. Mm -hmm. And then 11 is the Kane Mutiny Court Martial. I didn't want to put it in my top 10 for a couple of reasons. Okay. The first reason is that the movie, and this, this is how it's designed. It's supposed to be for this. If you check out the Robert Altman Kane Mutiny Court Martial from 1989 or so, it plays more or less similar. It's all performances, you know, and that's a choice of the directors, but it felt designed to be a Showtime Network original movie. And then obviously Showtime underwent this thing where it's kind of absorbed by Paramount Plus now. Paramount Plus is the main thing. And then they drop it as a streaming movie, which has a different vibe to it. The way that you talk about a TV movie direct to the Showtime Network versus a movie that goes directly to Netflix are two separate things. And if you check out the final credits of the film, they say teleplay by William Friedkin, as if he was yeah. knowingly adapting this for television, not dissimilar to 12 Angry Men, which he did in the 90s. If he had the foresight to know, okay, well, this is actually going to be more of a streaming film, maybe he would have handled things a little bit different. Maybe not. Maybe not. But it, the way that it opened threw me off because it feels like an episode of NCIS where it's got like the big military font and the music feels very CBS procedural. Yeah. Like you're stepping into an episode of Jack, but that's not to say anything bad about the quality of the movie, because again, it's all the performances. The, the yeah. movie lives and dies by the performances. Kiefer Sutherland gives a great performance. The, the I mean, who's the, the big standout here? This guy I turned Jason around Clark. on this guy. Yes, Jason Clark. Jason yeah. Clark had a terrific year for 2023. I thought he was this boring, interchangeable guy with um, Joel Edgerton. I would get those two mm. confused all the time. Oh, right. Okay. Jason Clark, though, between this, between Winning Time, Oppenheimer, he's fantastic. He's terrific. Great, great actor. And it also boasts Lance Reddick's final performance as well. I noticed he got an in memoriam, and I don't think Friedkin did himself. 
That was... uh, I I thought Lance Reddick was very Lance Reddick. Mm -hmm. He gave you what you're kind of expecting of him. A very The Wire uh, performance where it's like, yeah, he's just a stern guy that raises his voice and is kind of mad voice and is kind of angry. But I I mean, I wasn't impressed with it just because that's kind of what I'm expecting from from his performance. It's, I know he's dead, so you're not supposed to criticize it because he just died. But I wasn't really I, I was more impressed with Kiefer doing a very that's my might as well start. That's my number six, by the way. Okay. Uh, I was very impressed with with Kiefer because uh, he gives a very and I'm assuming that's because he's doing the Humphrey Humphrey Bogart character, right? It's the same. Uh, it felt very 1940s uh, to me. His accent, uh, the way that he would talk, and his mannerism and everything just felt very of that time, which I wasn't expecting from him. I find him to be very one note usually, yeah. or very very oh cool there's a, there's a key for performance you know what you're getting from it but with this maybe because he's how old is he now like 70 no <laughs> no he's not no he's, he's not he's, he's like 50 he's maybe hardly okay. 50 well he looks like 60 60 alcohol. something in this it's all yeah, the alcohol and... has it, i mean don't you remember that clip that came out back in what was it 2005 of him jumping off yeah. a balcony and onto a christmas tree like he's john McClain? He actually thought he was yeah. 24 for a second there. Really bad. Yeah, that's alcohol, what I was going to say. He's, this is the most uh, uh, convincing performance since when he pretended to be drunk in those videos instead of just unhinged. Uh, but uh, I thought as a, as a court drama, I haven't seen the original one, but I read that, uh, that uh, in that one you can see flashbacks to when they're in the boat. Mm-hmm. I actually like the fact that Freak Freakin decided to not do that uh, because then it's up to the audience to believe whoever you want to believe. And then you get the little slap at the end of the movie where Jason Clark delivers that monologue for like five minutes where the whole movie is just turned on his head and it's like, oh, fuck. Okay. Uh, uh, if you believe the wh whoever side uh, throughout the movie uh, that at the end kind of uh, um, frames everything back into, you know, what we did was kind of fucked up to to the Kiefer character. I even thought the the guy from The Office was good in this, Jake which I wasn't expecting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That he was very good in this too. So uh, it's not a it's not the most um, uh, creative a freaking movie. I, it kind of reminded me of something like Bug that I also really enjoyed uh very recently uh where most of it happens just inside of a room and it's more about the performances that he's able to get of out of these actors and i don't know if anyone was bad in it uh he i think he was able to get a very good performance from everyone in his last movie and the fact that it's so understated and it's all about the performance and how it feels like a play mm -hmm. uh i uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And um, when you compare it to the other freaking movies where things go bad or when, where actors get hurt or a sorcerer that I was reading earlier today about how some people got gangrene and he got malaria and like just a bunch of just shit that went bad. And then you watch the movie and it's an amazing movie. I really like Sorcerer. Uh, but ending it with something like this, I, I don't think uh, it ended bad i think this is a farewell for friedkin where you just get a lot of really good performances and uh what you would think is a very basic movie uh basic core drama when it comes to the story uh i i really liked it and but yeah jason clark here and also in oppenheimer which i'm sure will come uh back later in this episode uh he's had a, a very good year and, and he was probably other than Kiefer, the best part about this movie for me yeah, absolutely. I think it's a nice epilogue to his career, especially since Killer Joe is this very explosive, hey, I can still direct quality movies, comeback mm -hmm. film, because Bug was a bit low key. Killer Joe was low key as well back when it was released in 2011 or 2012. But this was a nice surprise to find out that even though he was dead, he had another movie ready to drop. And I think it stuck the landing. I think it was a very accomplished film. Uh, just to echo everything you had said. So why don't we get into the list proper now? You have how many movies? Because you said this was number six. Yeah, I have five. 
Okay, so it just narrowly it, missed both of our lists. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, it was. Uh, we should start with you because you have more, but it's also a year where I, I wouldn't expect that three biopics will make my top five, uh, but they did. Um, but let's start with your 10 to, to five first, and then, and then we can start with mine. See, my list is maybe almost 80% biopics. It's very, this was definitely the year of the biopic. Yeah. The, the best movies that were released this year were at the very least based on real events. And my first movie in the top 10 is not that. It's actually Saltburn, which we briefly talked about on Ryan Jackson's podcast. This is a hmm. film from Emerald Fennel. I think it's her f second film after a Promising Young Woman, which is not a movie I saw, but the entire conversation around that movie being the female Joker movie put me off to it. I didn't want anything to do with that movie. I might actually go back and watch. Also, I, I'm not a big fan of Bo Burnham. Bo Burnham has burnt out his goodwill in my opinion, and I just can't palate him. So I might actually go back and revisit that now, knowing that I enjoyed Saltburn. Saltburn really reminded me of the era that it takes place in, which is 2005 to like 2007 England. It has a Skins vibe to it, a Misfits kind of vibe, but it's done on such a budget and with these new modern actors like Barry Keoghan and Jacob Bellarati and shot in four by three. It looks great. It's edited very well. Is it a smart movie? It's not a smart movie. And as a matter of fact, there's a very dumb ending to this movie that almost undoes a lot of what I liked about it, but it didn't, it didn't. I just mm -hmm. kind of wish it had leaned into subtlety and there's nothing really subtle about this movie. So I don't know why I expected that. That's my number 10. For the year number because I, I, I i've got twice as many as yours what i'll do is yeah. I'll, I'll read off nine through seven how yeah. about that I haven't seen salt burn by the way uh it's just not something that i, I i'll i'll see uh oh no. you're good you're back uh, you're no, back you're I'm back good. uh i'll see it uh my girl told me that it's all over tiktok and she really wants to see it and was just like all right well i guess we'll watch this Man Eats Come movie together. I'm sure it would be fun. Uh, <laughs> you know, here's the thing but about I... Saltburn. The gay elements have been overemphasized with that movie. And those characters, as far as I know, they're not even gay. There's just everybody's bisexual. And everybody in England was bisexual in 2006. So It's just having fun. He's being a teenager yeah. or an early 20-year-old. I yeah. don't know how old he's supposed to be. He's about, he's about 19. Well, weren't you in England in 2006? No, <laughs> no, I, I was no. I went there when I was already an, an adult. Uh, uh, was Ten years. You, ago. you were an adult in two thousand six, weren't you? You were like, you were like twenty five, weren't you? <laughs> I was like thirty five <laughs> in two thousand six. <laughs> um, number nine for me, and I assume this will come up on your list, so we'll keep it brief. Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer. I caught a late night screening of. It's a great movie. We'll talk about it more later on. Number eight for me yeah. is May, December. This was a Netflix release from Todd Haynes. That's a director I'm not super familiar with. I remember watching Velvet Goldmine maybe about 15 years ago because I was like, oh, cool, Christian Bale's Batman. What else has he done? Well, I love American Psycho. What else has he done? Oh, he's dressing up like a girl. Okay. Uh, and I shut it off based off that. But May, December is based off of the, and it's very loosely based off the Mary Kay Letourneau story, where if you don't know anything about that, that was a 32-year-old teacher who fucked her 12-year-old Filipino student, and they later got together after she got out of prison for that mm. and had many oh, children. Yeah. So they took that, and they made it a Korean guy, played by Charles Melton, because that's his half of his ethnicity. And that's part of the movie. And they don't really make it seem like the Julianne Moore character, who she, she's playing that role, they don't really make it seem like she's necessarily evil or, or super terrible. She's very chaotic and mentally unstable for certain. But yeah. the villain of the movie is kind of Anne Hathaway, who's this actress who is 
you know, she's soaking into this scenery and observing how this woman behaves and trying to emulate her behavior, which is... Wait. Yes. I think you mean... That's not Anne Hathaway. Sorry, Natalie Portman. Natalie Portman. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, she's in this? Because I did start watching it. I just... No, I, I think that's one of those movies that I need to watch on a bigger screen that on my computer and uh i made it maybe half an hour i made it to when natalie portman is like seductively kissing her hands um, which is i think half an hour in mm -hmm. um but but I, I i i just thought just like napoleon this is probably a movie that i need to give more attention and more more uh more of a chance to so i haven't seen it but uh I honestly didn't know that it was real. I, I'm familiar with that story with the perverted old woman and the Filipino boy, uh, but I didn't know that that's what this was. It was getting there when I was watching it and I stopped. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll give it a chance. I'll, I'll, I feel like there's a lot of movies like Godzilla that I haven't been able to watch and I don't want to see a cam version of it because that's that's a waste of what the movie is supposed to be, or how it's supposed to be just like Oppenheimer. Uh, I wanted to either see it in the theater or at least on my big TV with a good sound system because it is a movie theater movie. Um, and I, I, I don't know if May, December would qualify as a movie theater movie, but I thought just because of the people that are involved, not familiar with the guy at all, but just Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman uh, are, are very good. So I, uh, I haven't seen it, uh, but from what I've seen, um, everyone's praising it. So I'll I'll definitely provide an update when I do watch it. I mean, we can always do a revision special down the road when you're fully. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But May, December, I thought was great. And I didn't know anything about the movie before watching it or rather I heard in passing. It was about the Mary Kay Letourneau story based off the cover art for it. And the other movie he did, Carol, I just assumed it was a lesbian movie. So, yeah that's what i thought too and i had no intentions of watching that just like i had no intentions of watching carol uh number seven for me is napoleon ridley scott's napoleon and i was really surprised by this movie because i didn't expect it to land in my top 10 at all but joaquin phoenix's performance and ridley scott's direction is just fantastic joaquin is very subdued in this movie compared to something like Bo is Afraid. People have been complaining about that. They've been saying, oh, why do you have Joaquin not acting interesting? It's like, is he supposed to go over the top every single time? He's supposed to be a kind of reserved, strategic yeah. mastermind here who gets riled up because his wife is just a harlot. She loves sleeping with other men. But you know what? The romance in this movie is so much more authentic than in past lives. And that woman didn't even cheat on her husband with that Korean guy. Josephine cheats left and right, but they have a real bond. And he kind of talks himself into liking this sick game. It's very deep water where it's like, he's getting driven crazy. He's taking off his big hat and just folding it up quietly because he's so annoyed. And he's getting like, guys are coming up to him in his infantry and they're like, Josephine's fucking the czar. And he's like, you're not having dessert today. So it's like, it's stuff like that. And uh, I thought it was terrific. The only thing I didn't like about Napoleon was the color grading. The color grading is very blue, very gray. Mm -hmm. It's overwhelming. It takes over the skin tones, the sky, the grass, the ear. It's uh, not the best, but it's a worthwhile film. And I actually think Ridley Scott might be peaking as a director now in his 80s which is probably a controversial statement to make because he's made so many of these great films. I think the 1980s, he did fantastic with Blade Runner. He did Alien, obviously. And that is a masterpiece. Legend is fun, probably. I haven't watched that in 25 years, I'm guessing. But it, this last string of movies has been particularly strong. So I'm very happy with Ridley Scott's latest output. I, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Uh, again, I don't care about the historic accuracy because I'm not familiar with Napoleon. The only thing I know about Napoleon is that he was responsible for the death of a bunch of people and he was a little man and that's it. <laughs> I don't really have anything, you know, uh, attached to how accurate this movie has to be for me to enjoy it. It's a Joaquin Phoenix movie, and that's usually quality, no matter what it is. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it.
He's always good. Even in movies I don't like, like Come On, Come On, he still manages to make it very entertaining. By the way, I just got a comment on YouTube here, which is somebody in our cavalry saying to the, the past lives commentary that occurred in the past 24 hours, we are putting out another video talking about that. But someone had written, yep, exactly what I expected. I could immediately tell that this movie was what, what this movie was promoting about modern Western relationships, hard pass, glad I avoided. And you know what? For all those people out there that are on the same page, thank you. And I'm glad you, you're listening to me and will avoid this movie because it's not, not good. It's not good for the heart, for the soul, or what it's trying to teach you about how to conduct yourself. So um, check that out. Check out the past lives clip. It's been great for this YouTube channel. We hit 10,000 subscribers and also on Facebook, hit 20,000 followers. So now go over to patreon.com slash lowers and sign up in the $5 tier for exclusive episodes. Patreon.com slash lowers. All right, my number six, and then we'll kick off your number five. My number six is The Holdovers, which we talked more about on an earlier episode. The Holdovers was a nice surprise. I always like Alexander Payne, but I don't necessarily go out of my way to see each one of his films. I don't think he's ever delivered a bad movie. I really enjoyed Election. The Descendants is great. Holdovers, no different. Fantastic cast. I was happy that Paul Giamatti walked away with the Golden Globe for Best Actor for this movie. And uh, the actress who is the main supporting role after Dominic Sessa, her name is Divine Joy Randolph. I'll tell you something. She, she sounds like a Boston black person in this movie. I think... Uh, what could be considered, and I consider, uh, a Ben Affleck classic, which is Air. I really enjoyed Air. I thought Air was really well directed. There's a lot of really good performances from people that uh, that you enjoy popping up. Uh, you have a very good Chris Tucker. Uh, Jay Moore is very good in it, even though it's not someone that I particularly like. Uh, Viola Davis is good in it. Um, and just, uh, I think it's just enjoyable to see, a, a Matt Damon performance playing a regular guy that's good at his job and Ben Affleck just playing a kind of a old school, just asshole wearing uh, jumpsuits. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, I, I, um, I was not familiar with the, the story of this. So that was also interesting. I'm a fan of the shoes, <laughs> but, uh. It, it kind of felt like a, a, a very um, big short-ish, uh, which is a movie that I enjoyed when it came out. I don't know if it holds up. I don't know if I would still like it. Uh, but uh, I, I just thought that Ben Affleck was able to get a very fun, um, a movie that doesn't really drag or overstays its welcome. And he gets very good performances from everyone. Uh, and it was just a, a movie that I would definitely recommend to anyone. Uh, so that... By that alone um, makes it in my top. Um, w whenever a movie like this uh, that feels uh, small, it feels like uh, uh, a movie that's um, carried by the performances and how everyone just seems to be having fun watching it. It just feels like a, like a, it would be like an enjoyable atmosphere to be in. Not sure if uh, if it is. I'm not sure how fun Ben Affleck is in his sets, but I think um, if uh, it's the case that uh, people are just, you know, he's just making movie with movies with his friends and people that he likes and enjoys being around. That's kind of what it reflects on screen for this movie. And uh, it, it was just an, an enjoyable time uh, watching this very, um, I, I don't want to say it's a deep movie because it's really not. Um, it's, it's a very dialogue heavy. Uh, it is well shot but he doesn't really do anything that would blow your mind it's just uh same with one of my other top movies uh that's a biography or, or biographical movie about something that actually happened and how it's supposed to have happened um i i just had a really good time with air uh and that's that's enough for me to to make it to my my five yeah i would say that the performances in air are terrific air is going to be on my top five as well mm -hmm. I think what came like that movie probably originated from Amazon needing 
new material for Amazon Prime because of COVID. And it feels way more scaled back and stripped down than the type of film that Ben Affleck would typically make. If you take a look at Gone Baby Gone or The Town, I think he did a third movie called Live By Night that I have not seen. They're all way more maximalist than what Air is. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Air feels cheap at any point. And certainly it does not cheap out with the cast. You have a very A-list cast here. As, you know, they well, even, even Argo, in... right? Argo said Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, and Argo yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, I completely... I hated Argo. I thought that was so boring. But Air is great. Air is a, a real rebound. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> they don't show Michael Jordan. Why don't, why don't you no. think they showed Michael Jordan? Because it's just... Oh, they he's he, can't afford like, it. Well, yeah. He's, I mean, what are you going to de-age fifty-five-year-old yeah. <laughs> Michael Jordan with his Hitler mustache? That's not going to work. With his, yeah, his head is a lot fatter than it was when he, you know, when he before he started spending his millions on cigars and whiskey and gambling. Uh, he, yeah, he's he's a young man in this movie. So I like what they did, though. I like that they got someone that kind of has his physicality but every time his face was about to be on camera then we just kind of just cut to someone where you can kind of see it in in the corner but not really uh yeah i i thought ben affleck did a really great I, i'm excited to see what he's going to do now um because yeah i wasn't a huge friend of fargo i didn't see live by night and uh every time someone uh takes a picture of him on the street he looks miserable so hopefully <laughs> Hopefully he's back to enjoying, you know, being and making movies again. And uh, this was a, a great uh, rebound to steal your joke. Do you think uh, Jennifer Lopez abuses him? I don't know abuse. I think he just gets the Latin American woman treatment. <laughs> I don't know. He's, he never seems happy around a woman. That's the recurring thing here. Yeah. With Ana de Armas, he wasn't happy. With uh, Jennifer Conley, or Jennifer Garner, excuse me. He wasn't happy either. Yeah. It do, it doesn't seem like he's ever happy around his significant other. He's only happy with when uh um Matt Damon is around. You see <laughs> yeah. that clip from the Golden Globes? Oh yeah. He, yeah, that where he uh Matt Damon's coming. They're very gray, by the way. Uh, I saw that with the, what they actually look like without the makeup and without the acting thing. I saw um Goodwill Hunt hunting the other day and holy shit. Uh, I'm uh, old. It's just you just feel like we've aged a lot just to see what they look like now and what they looked like then. And you know, a uh, uh, Robin Williams that kind of looks forty something or fifty something, and now he's. And how about me at age six on the set of Goodwill? Right. One of the stars, one of the biggest stars to come out of Goodwill Hunting. Yeah. That's what everyone was saying when they saw me on yeah. the set. They said that kid, he's gonna be somebody. That kid, he's going to spend four years making his first yeah. movie and really <laughs> reworking it top to bottom. Um, yes, uh, that was uh, that was quite some time ago. And boy, if you want to hear just like a nice audible treat, listen to the commentary track on Armageddon with Ben Affleck. Oh, yeah. Because he's just bad-mouthing the movie, and he's drunk, and he's talking about Harvey That's Weinstein, great. and they're telling yeah. him to shut Like, they're being rude to him. It's great. It's a great listen. So... Air is a fantastic film. It is in my top five. It is not my number five, though. My number five is Godzilla Minus One, which I already did a separate review. Godzilla Minus One is a total throwback to 1980s, 1990s disaster films of that particular era. It's just a quality movie all around. It kind of reminds me of Steven Spielberg when he's really good. And, uh, you know, the characters are very... Well, I won't even say that they're likable because the protagonist is not an especially likable guy. He's kind of a coward. It's definitely, without question, the best Godzilla movie that maybe has been produced, period. Uh, Shin Godzilla, I went back and I rewatched that one because people had like similar comments about that movie when it had dropped in 2016 where they were talking about, oh, this is more than just a Godzilla movie. This is actually a great film. And that's a weird movie. I don't know if I would really put it on the same shoulders as Godzilla Minus One. I think Godzilla Minus One is absolutely a great film in general. And I said this when I talked about it with you not that long ago. Uh, uh, I think this movie would be great even without Godzilla in it. I think if you just had these characters, this makeshift family that is built right after World War II, 
and remove the Godzilla component, it still thrives on its own as a fantastic movie. The visual effects are great as well. You know, Godzilla minus one. Everybody has been, you know, f- you know, talking this movie up left and right. I'm not saying anything new here. It is my number five for the year. Yeah, haven't been able to see that, but I'm I'm excited to see it. I'm a big fan of old monster movies, and this seems to be right up my alley. Uh, number four. It's a movie that I actually saw today. Um, it's an a very or what it feels like a very small independent uh, movie called Fremont. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. I believe the director is Afghani. Uh, and it's the story of uh, an Afghani woman that works at a factory where they make uh, fortune cookies. Uh, and uh, it's about her just trying to uh, live a kind of a miserable life that immigrants live in the United States where the culture is completely different to what you see uh, in the United States. Uh, it's in black and white. It's shot in four by three. Uh, so it reminded me a lot of uh, of uh, Tomorrow Night, or Coffee, Cigarettes, that type of uh, filmmaking. Um, it's uh, It's one of those movies where the main character has like an interesting backstory and like an interesting thing going on for them, but they serve more as like a your or the audience's avatar and uh, the uh, they're su- living in a world surrounded by very weird, very quirky, very interesting side characters that have like their own thing going. Uh, and uh, it's it's beautifully shot. The cinematography is really, really nice, uh, black and white. And uh, there is uh, the the guy from the bear shows up at the end, um, kind of to like wrap up her story because her, the, her whole thing is that she wants to feel like what it's like to be in love with someone, or if it's even okay to feel the need uh, of of loving someone while people are suffering back uh, in Afghanistan, uh, but. Uh, the way that is shot, all, all of the characters surrounding her, and, and uh, it's it's very funny in in a very understated way, uh, and I, I really enjoy the way that that is shot, the way that it moves along. It's one of those movies where, just like Coffee and Cigarettes and Tomorrow Night, uh, not a lot happens, and it's it's a very small story, a very very simple story but i i guess that's why i en- enjoyed it more than than i expected um but uh visually and the performances of this weird there's a weird afghani restaurant owner that she hangs out with that likes watching afghani soap operas on tv but he's also very ashamed of the fact that he enjoys those uh those shows there's uh her best friend or one of her friends is this uh larger woman that goes on uh blind dates uh, and it's like the only friend that she has uh, in the world. Uh, her bosses are these two, uh, this Asian couple, where the husband is this older Asian man that's very nice, very polite, and is very interested in her. Um, it doesn't feel creepy, but you kind of get the vibe of him liking her. Uh, but it could also be that he's just very polite and very interested in the fact that she's not American. And the wife is just a total, uh, just a, a Asian, older Asian bitch <laughs> that <laughs> hate her, hates her pretty much because she gets that attention from from the from her husband. Uh, but it it felt very Jim Jarmusch in the eighties, very quirky little uh, black and white four by three movie that uh, I believe it's only like ninety minutes. Uh, but I, I I really enjoyed watching, and I wasn't I I wasn't expecting. Um, to enjoy it so much, especially from a log line of, uh, you know, uh, an Afghani uh, woman that works at a, a fortune cookie factory uh, f- trying to find love, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's called uh, Fremont. Uh, and I that's my number four. You know, you, I didn't even know about this movie until you brought it up earlier today and you asked me if I had seen it and that you were enjoying it. But I'm going to check this movie out. I've been in a Jim Jarmusch mood for a second. I almost went to go see night on earth in 35 millimeter at the brattle when they were playing that leading up to christmas i really wish i had gone to see 
either that movie or Eyes Wide Shut when they were playing it. But Eyes Wide Shut, I've I've gotten so spoiled now in my head where I know the difference between the DCP and the 35, and I would have never thought of this before, but I've had to think about this because there are projects that are about to be released, so I have to know, and it's like, oh, so you're paying to sit in a theater and watch a Blu-ray. Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to check this movie out. I didn't know that Jeremy Allen White was in it either. It looks great. I just did a quick search on my phone while you were talking about it, and uh, I'm going to make an effort to take a look at that. Uh, Number four for me, we talked about him a bit earlier tonight, is Michael Mann's Ferrari. And I did release a quick 15, 20-minute episode. I think it might have been 20 minutes. Uh, While you were away, I released a 20-minute episode on Ferrari, where I talked about the film right after having seen it, the New York Film Festival, and Ferrari's great. Ferrari's one of the best movies that Michael Mann has done in uh, probably about 20 or 30 years. There's really genuinely shocking scenes in this movie. I think I might have discussed this before with you on the proper show and not as a bonus show, but Ferrari might be an episode we cover in the future with Brendan McCauley when he makes his comeback. There have been a lot of people... A lot of movies regulars who have been on the bench for most of 2023 that we're going to re you know, we're going to get them back into the fold heading into 2024. Some faces you haven't seen in a while. So Ferrari is my number four. I'll keep it light for right now. Uh, what came in third for you, Hans? Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon mm, okay. is my three. I'm not the. You got through the whole thing. Yes. I, I feel like. <laughs> 2023 was the year of the long movie when I didn't mind that they were long uh, because you have Oppenheimer, Achilles of the Flower Moon. There's uh, K-Mutiny was like two and a half, I think, right? No, uh, I, I, don't, I think K-Mutiny might have just not? been two hours flat, if that. Okay. Well, I feel like I've watched a lot of long movies this year, but I, the only one that I, my, I'm trying to think, uh oh uh rebel moon is the only one where i was like fuck all right this feels long but uh yeah i uh i think scorsese i'm glad that he's still making movies uh he still has it i i don't know if i would have picked DiCaprio to play retard with bad teeth for three hours but i did enjoy his portrayal of her retard with bad teeth uh, throughout this movie and uh again another another director that's how old is he like 90 like 200 how how old is scorsese Scorsese? uh he's about 81 okay and uh i hope he keeps making movies until he's not able to because uh this were very enjoyable three and a half hours um i I don't know how i feel about the ending i feel like the ending um the the way it ended with like the whole aerial shot of the natives dancing and all that, I was kind of like, all, all right, I see, I see what you're doing, old man. But uh, yeah, we're very entertaining. Um, it didn't, I didn't feel the runtime, uh, and uh, uh, as opposed to what happened to me with the first and only time that I've attempted to to watch The Irishman, where I just couldn't get through it, this one just flew by and i i had a lot of, of fun watching it i, I with the I, irishman uh, is is it that you came to i mean honestly even when it released the cg on the faces was not great but is that a problem with you no i just i don't know i might i might have to just give it another chance i think maybe i just wasn't in the right headspace i just i got like 40 minutes in and i was like i don't know i still have what two hours to go and i just i never finished it and it's one of those things of a same with with oppenheimer like i've been putting it off for so long because of the length of it and i i regret doing that because of you know what i thought after seeing it so maybe that's going to be one of those cases where i i just put it off for for no reason and then end up enjoying it more than i i did when i first started yeah i will have more to say about killers of the flower moon in a little bit so okay. we'll keep it at that. My number three for the year, we already talked about it. It's Air. Ben Affleck's Air. Right. I went to go see this in theaters. It was a pretty empty showing. I, it was still like a recovering from COVID time where it dropped. I think it came out in January or February. It was very early this year. I'm not sure why they didn't hold off until Oscar season because I think it would have had a much better shot at a lot of these awards. And uh, I was very pleasantly surprised 
by this movie. I think I was spurred by watching Winning Time. Or maybe, I can't remember if I watched Winning Time before or after Air, but it really continued my interest in basketball properties and getting into the, the late 20th century history of, of basketball. But also, I loved Michael Jordan as a kid. I had a cardboard cutout of Michael Jordan in my bedroom. I wanted to play basketball, but I was a tiny, pudgy little white boy, and I just could not throw a basketball for the life of me. So it was not yeah. going to work out. It was not my not my fate. Even though I lived in the I oh. lived in the hood, I was at the basketball court every day, and uh, I was not the reason my team ever won. Yeah, I um, I was very fat, and I would my mom would have a. Uh, a group of older women, which was like 40 something, play basketball, and I would go play basketball with them. You just and, dunk uh, on them? You were six foot four yeah. at the time, fucking <laughs> owning these bitches. I was just shack my way into the paint and just. You're just knocking books. them over, <laughs> throwing the basketball at them afterward. Yeah, you're, it's not that far from what actually happened. But yeah, okay. Anyway, my number two, uh, Blackberry. Whoa. Uh, Black actually, hold on. Bl this is my number two as well. Okay. All right. All right. So Matt Johnson, I'm not very familiar. I think I've seen the Nirvana show. I think Nirvana, the band, I think is Nirvana, the, the band, the show. Yeah. I feel like Matt Johnson is somebody who would be really up your alley. Cause he's got like mm -hmm. the same, like he's got, I feel like he's got the same comedy style that you tend to be into. Yeah. 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 I, the, if you can get a performance from Jay Baruchel in 2023 that I'm like, I yeah, all right, I enjoyed it. I I think he was great in this. Uh, Glenn Howerton is someone that I think we need to keep an eye on uh, because everything that I've seen from him recently, he's just knocks it out of the park and he's great in this. Um, and I also like the fact that uh, Matt Johnson plays a very early set rogan like character in this before he became insufferable before i can't stand to see him on screen anymore but in this he plays the sidekick goofy character perfectly and very likable uh and i think uh for a biopic uh visually again you're not you know uh, creating uh or or doing anything that's uh, amazingly creative but i think for the type of movie that it is, uh, they nailed the time uh, of, of when this was happening. Uh, I think everything from the sets to the way everyone was dressed and the way that they were communicating with each other was very much of the time and, and it was really well portrayed. And uh, yeah, it was another just like air. Like I had a lot of fun watching a movie about fucking the creation of a phone or the creation of smartphones, I mm. guess, which is not something that I would particularly care for but uh i think matt johnson did a really great job on this and i'm i really want to see what, it, what what's next for his career yeah this is the first serious movie i think for for matt johnson he did have one other right after doing the dirties that just kind of fell under the radar nobody really seemed to pay attention to it and then he disappeared for a bit because nirvana the band the show was on i think it was viceland when that was a network they put it on there which was not like a popular network channel at all. And then it was just kind of this low-key, weird, niche thing that people would talk about on uh, YouTube comments, really. But yeah, no, I mean, the most accomplished actor in this cast is Michael Ironside. You have Jay Baruchel, who you already said before, is just kind of this insufferable creature these days. Glenn Howerton, who nobody took seriously. Matt Johnson, you can't really count when like the director puts himself as the supporting role as like a real actor in there. Martin Donovan, who hasn't done, I actually, I think he was in Tenet, but you know, he's long away from Hal Hartley. Sung Wan Cho, who is probably best known as a Vine person because he does the anime voice. That was the fat Asian guy in the movie. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, to garner good performances from all of these people and create like a serious contender for what is the best movie of the year, is quite the uh, quite the feat. It is it is a great film. It was a very enjoyable film, inspirational film, and I love how it ends. I think it's terrific that there's really only one person who is significantly punished at the end of this movie, and it's because they deviate from their ethos. So BlackBerry is a great movie. We agree with President Obama. It is one of the best movies of the year, and that will make way 
to what is going to be our number one picks. Now, what did you decide is your number one film of the year, Hans? I'm going to be a, a film bro and, and uh, do the Christopher Nolan for this Ooh, year. Whoa. Okay. I should have known yeah. from process of elimination. You are on the same yeah. page with the Golden Globes then. I, I guess so. That's, uh, that's sad. Uh, but I just think that um, I think it's his best movie. I think um, for me to sit and watch a three and a half hour movie and at no point feel bored or feel like I'm watching a three and a half hour movie about a story that honestly, I don't know, who gives a shit? Like, I, oh, commies and fucking, oh, the bomb and uh, Japan and all these. I, that and, and the three and the runtime really put me off. I wish I had seen it in the theater. I didn't. Uh, my my girlfriend saw it in the theater and she told me that I'm probably going to be bored by this movie because it's a lot of talking. At no point I was bored. I think uh, I love seeing autistic directors work with autistic actors. And you can tell that Christopher Nolan is a little, you know, he's got a little bit of that, the, the Kubrick it, uh, when it comes to the, the tisms. And, uh, and I think... Um, What's his name? Uh, fuck, his name is escaping me right now. Uh, the main actor, uh, Cillian Murphy. Murphy. You can tell that he's also like he doesn't really enjoy the whole social aspect of being such a huge star as he is. But his performance was incredible in this. Uh, you can feel the pain through his face and everything that the American government puts him through. I thought it was really funny. The 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 mirroring of how you know if you know anyone that's deemed a communist back in the day is pretty much the same as if you have a russian friend friend now in 2023 and i thought that was that was, that was really funny of how oh fuck that's literally the same thing that's going on right now they're just not going to put you in jail but i mean kind of sort of they might try to um he seems like he's constantly battling what the respectable amount of self-defense is when mm. it comes to these situations where people are frequently putting him up against the wall and saying listen this is, can go really bad for you but he's trying yeah. to maintain his sense of self throughout the movie without crossing the line and i i think it really that character I think emphasizes a lot of the traits of the supporting cast around him. Like the, uh, the actress who plays his wife is I think Emily Blunt, right? Blunt, yeah. Her, her performance is great. It's probably a career best performance from her. Uh, you, you've got like very small roles in this movie littered with a-list Everyone. actors like Casey Affleck yeah. is randomly great in the two minutes that he's in this movie. <laughs> Gary Oldman almost steals the show playing, Dewey playing Dwight. Uh, no, no, he doesn't yeah. play Dwight. He plays um, Truman. Sorry. Uh, Truman. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's hilarious as Truman. You know, the performances across the board are terrific. Benny Safdie, of course. Everybody Dude, was going to say Josh Benny Peck is good in this. Yes. It's yeah. like he got a performance out of fucking Josh Peck. Um, you have uh, Rami, uh, Rami or Rami or what would you say his name? Malik for like three minutes. He was great in this. Jason Clark again. Robert Downey Jr. Is, I mean, do you even have to mention how great he is with that hairpiece? Uh, um, Josh Harnett. Josh Hartnett's is Josh very <laughs> against type in this movie. He's wonderful. He's fantastic. Uh, someone that I usually or I don't think I've ever given credit uh, to because I feel like his career is very much the, well, he's the chubby Jewish friend. David Krumholtz, it's amazing in this. He's so, I mean, he he does play a chubby Jew, but he's so good as that character in this. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, it, there's no one weak link when it comes to performances. And I, I think he's, I, I mean... Obviously, Christopher Nolan is one of the greatest directors that we have living now from his, the track record of his movies. And and no matter who you talk to, you you might take a little bit of credit off because he did uh, cave shit, even though he did it in his way. But I think like his movies are always at least interesting. But here, there's no... The guy that played um, Einstein was so good, too. I don't know who he is. I think I his name's I'm, Tom Court... Uh, no, no, no. Tom Conti? 
Uh, he was in great performance. So ev everyone that was on screen at any point, uh, uh, Flocky from Vikings, one of the Scarsgars brothers. Uh, I think I think he's who I think is probably the most talented of the lot. I think he was great in this too. So the three and a half hours again flew by. I thought the score went along with the story so well that at no point it felt like it was dragging. At no point did I was bored with it. The visuals are incredible. The the way he used lenses to show emotion from the characters. I, I just feel like w when it comes to filmmaking alone, at least from what I've seen recently from him, I think this is his most accomplished movie. And Oh, Dane DeHane. Uh, Sorry to interrupt yes. you. Dane also, DeHane. He, he brought Dane DeHane yeah. back after falling off the face of the earth in 2015. Dane after Spider-Man, right? Yes. Yeah. And again, amazing. So I was very impressed with, with this. I'm glad that it's uh, I'm glad that it's getting as as many awards. As I hope it, it, he wins uh, a lot more. Hopefully, uh not that I really care about award shows that much, but the fact that this is being recognized as opposed to things like Coda or things like Nomadland or things like those movies that just barely feel like movies, uh, it's a good sign. Uh, and, uh, well, it's Christopher Nolan, so I don't think it's, uh, it's a controversial thing to say that, yeah, let's, let's see him do whatever, <laughs> whatever he wants next, and I'll be there because if, if he's able to... Uh, make me sit for three and a half hours with a biopic about it, the guy that invented the atomic bomb and have me uh, uh, want him to win uh, uh, by the end of it, I think. So a uh, uh, great job. So uh, again, um, it's probably a movie that I, I'll rewatch again, even, even though uh, the runtime is that long, but I couldn't find any faults in it. Um, and I, I wish that I had seen it in the in the theater. Yeah, no, I, I think Oppenheimer is a tremendous success of a film. And it made me want to revisit all of his other movies that I kind of was just mm -hmm. eh, on. Specifically, yeah, yeah. things like Dunkirk, which I forget was even made pretty often. Or Tenet, I did not even watch. So maybe I'll get around to doing nope. that finally. My number one for the year is Killers of the Flower Moon which I did not have uh, necessarily high or low expectations for it. It was just another movie on the slate for 2023 that I was, okay, I'm going to have to set aside three and a half hours. It's going to feel like a slog, maybe. Um, hopefully not. Because even though I enjoyed The Irishman, The Irishman was in the top ten for me the year it came out, there were pacing problems with that movie. And the three hours felt like three hours. This movie's even longer. It's almost the length of Zack Snyder's Justice League. And when I thought the movie was wrapping up, I checked the time and I was like, oh, there's another hour yeah. and five minutes left here. Mm -hmm. But I didn't mind it because this movie feels so rich with character that it's almost like a novel. Like you're, it's, you're basically cracking a novel open and diving into this world. Uh, the way that the performances are and the, the cinematography the direction from Martin Scorsese, nothing feels old manish, which he mm -hmm. kind of got the vibe of again with Irishman, since he was very impressed with the CG de aging. And you don't yeah. have any of the tricks employed with that movie. It's just strictly performances and plot devices that make you empathize with some pretty terrible characters. And DiCaprio's performance, I think, is. Great. Is it his best performance? No. I was talking about this on a recent podcast interview that you and I were on. The star of this movie is not even Lily Gladstone, who does give a very, very good performance. I think she deserves to probably win Best Actress this year at the Oscars and Golden Globes and all the other ceremonies. It's Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro is actually acting. He's acting. He's alive. He's playing a character that's not quite like himself. And it's this this mesh of the asshole stepfather he plays in Tobias Wolf's This Boy's Life meshed with Max Cady from Cape Fear a bit. And there are aspects of the dialogue with this movie that I really love that feel true to reality, where you have William Hale, who is the character that Robert De Niro plays, and Ernest Burkhart, who's his nephew, their family, they have this very evil plan of we're going to integrate in with the Native Americans here 
and um, we're going to take them out one after another so we can inherit the the Osage land. The way that they talk to each other is so, it felt very real, like, oh, your wife's sick. Well, you know, you got to be there for, her. like, he's fake mm -hmm. empathizing, but he's like, you know, she's sick. She, you're going to need to be there for her and be by her side because she needs you. She needs your earnest. But he's poisoning her, and they both know he's poisoning her, and that's been the plan all along, but they don't talk about it. They don't say it overtly. It's just you got to give her her injection, Ernest. And it's this way of being able diabetes. to maintain. Yes, she's got diabetes, <laughs> and they are putting some sort of poison in the diabetes medication to kill her because they've killed the rest of her family. And to it's get the land, right? To get the land, to, to seize the land from these people who don't seem to know any better. And she's got to go off to Washington and beg the president to investigate. And this forms the FBI. And a lot of the right-wing people online have been like, oh, so this is just a covert FBI propaganda piece. It's a puff piece to promote the FBI. Shut up. It's part Don't of the story. The it's, just, it's, it's just what happened, okay? That's just <laughs> it, it's how it played out, okay? Yes. Oh, watch Go watch Lady Ballers, you smooth. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this is not the America of Oliver Stone's JFK, okay? This is yeah. the story. There are plenty of movies where that is the hero. It's not the modern FBI, not the modern... Unless they're probably always evil, okay? Got it, fine. But for this, it doesn't matter. Jesse Plemons, his big fat face, acne pockmarked face, comes in and saves the day like a cowboy hero. And... um yeah, I, I just I thoroughly was impressed with the the quality of filmmaking and the skill that was required to be employed to make this movie as great as it was. And I cannot recommend it enough. Killers of the Flower Moon. I similar to you with Oppenheimer. I wish I had seen this in the theater. I would not have mind minded uh, being sat down in the theater for three and a half hours. I feel like I've up my tolerance with that because so many movies this year were bordering on four hours. Uh, yeah. But also just Zack Snyder's Justice League, that masterpiece of a film, I kind of retroactively wish I could have put it at number one for that year, but I didn't feel that was number one for the year that year. Um, really? What was number one that year? Out. Private Chat. Do you remember? Oh. How do you feel about that in retrospect? I still like, I think Private Chat's a great movie, you know, but I think now I go and look at that year and see Zack Snyder's Justice League for a much greater success than maybe at the time. At the time, I felt inclined to give it to, because they're, they're all in the same tier in terms of quality of film. They're just very different films. But I think what Zack Snyder managed to do was extremely impressive. And I probably would give it number one in retrospect looking back now. But I think Private Chat is an excellent movie and definitely deserving of number one for my list. And it will stay at number one because I don't Are you make excited about revisions. Are you excited about James Gunn's DC, DC universe that's coming? I, I, I can't be bothered with that. I'm just, I'm out on superheroes now completely. Even yeah. Batman, I'm done. I'm, I don't really have interest in the Batman two or the Colin Farrell penguin show. I don't, have an investment in any of that nothing about it to me. i'll see joker, joker too. too i'll see joker too that's the that's the end though because that will probably flop realistically yeah. people are going to find out about find out about that movie being a musical the trailer will drop and they'll see a song and a dance and they're going to be like that's not what i remember from five years ago they'll show up and then it'll have a big drop off the second week and it'll be one of these weird failed sequels that we talk about in the future i think that's the destiny for it and that's what it should be but we'll see maybe i'm wrong yeah i'm completely out too i uh even the guardians of the galaxy movies that i enjoyed the first two i still haven't seen the third one i don't know when i will if i will i don't i just i feel like um it's not just the oversaturation but also the decisions that they've taken it's just not anything that I feel is worth my time. And I'm not even pretending like my time is worth anything. So that should tell you everything <laughs> that you need to know about, you know, uh, all these movies. I uh, recently read that their Mar Marvel is thinking about doing a female Iron Fist. And I'm like, okay, so I have three favorite 
comic book characters. I have a uh, Hawkeye, uh, Namor, and Iron Fist. Hawkeye, uh, they made a TV show where he takes a uh, second role to a teenager that does the same thing as him, but better, but better a teenage girl. So that's dead. Uh, Namor is Mexican or was Mexican for that uh, for that um, uh, Black Panther movie that I didn't see because of that. Uh, and now Iron Fist, which they already did a, a really boring and bad Netflix series with the Iron Fist character, and now they're just gender changing it. So there's really nothing in this genre for me anymore. I am also old enough to, I think, to to get to the point where I'm like, I okay, I enjoyed the superhero movies in my twenties. I'm kind of. Like that's that's really how I feel too. Can offer me. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's that's the point I'm at. It feels like all right. I've seen everything that needs to be seen. What else? We can saw you when do? they were good. You yes. know, when they were yeah. So now it's just it feels like it's just a slow death. And same with Star Wars and all of that whole universe too. It's just like okay, cool. I can still enjoy the old ones. I was never a huge fan to begin with, but anything that's coming out or at least that's rumored to be coming out. It's not interesting. It's no. a combination of two things because it's not just the fact that these brands have subverted into trying to get a female audience. It is the fact that maybe they are so reliant on source material that you know they're not going to take any really daring creative decisions with the material. Take a look at Tim Burton's Batman. What did he do? He had the Joker kill Batman's parents, and it's a twist that is introduced mm -hmm. three quarters of the way into the movie. They would never do that now. They wouldn't do that now because they would go, oh, what, you haven't read the comic books? Well, the comic books are fucking yeah. shit. The comic books suck. I made a joke on Facebook just today or yesterday where they're doing Godzilla, and it's not even verse, it's Godzilla and Kong, the new empire, and oh, yeah. Godzilla, to sell toys or something, is now pink. It's a pink Godzilla. He's got the atomic rays in his spine. And I made the joke, oh, they even made Godzilla in SJW? And someone non-ironically replied, read the comics. There's God, there's I got to read Godzilla comics? comics now? How about I... I mean, there's 30 manga, movies. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. I'll read the comics to understand why he's pink. No, fuck that. I'm not seeing this movie. I, I, I hate these American Godzilla movies. Wait, you don't... It, are you one of those people that don't want to read 30 books to know why Baby Yoda can carry a lightsaber? I mean, why not dig into the extended universe of any movie? What's the May-December extended universe? Where's the prequel yeah. comic where she's touching his little dick when he's 12 years old? <laughs> you know? Did you read the comics? You fucking retard. What do you hear yourself? Do you th like think about how you come across when you say shit like that? I can see your full name and your photo and your ugly fucking girlfriend. And it takes a lot. It takes a lot for me to not post that picture in reply and try to humiliate you. That's that's my actual response anytime to any of these people. Yeah, I mean, I'm I think the two mediums are are completely different and they should not be attached. Uh but, I mean, I just complain about them gender changing my favorite characters, so maybe I should not be speaking. But at the same time, uh, yeah, the changes that they make for no reason at all, I don't, I don't want to have to read a bunch of comics just to get an understanding as to why you're doing that in your movie. Just do, you know, just don't make the change <laughs> i don't i don't want to have to do homework to understand why you're making these decisions you know uh you shouldn't have to do homework but here's That's the thing the too th a lot of these comics have a thousand versions of every single one of these characters you can say oh go to the comics it's actually it's sourced in the comics and any decision yeah. that is made in the movie could probably apply oh there's a female batman yeah there's one in the comics that doesn't make the comics good that doesn't make yeah any of that good so i don't, don't want to see that movie yeah or no or enhances anything that yeah oh did you know uh the iron heart character is a spinoff of iron man and it's always been a black girl i don't give cool. a shit i don't i don't yeah. care at all i don't care even a little bit you couldn't pay even if they got robert downey jr back and they're like you know what this has nothing to do with any of marvel it's gonna be r-rated he's gonna be killing people he's gonna be a drunk in the movie remember when tony stark was a drunk 
when he had yeah. drug problems and alcohol problems. What the fuck happened to that? They backed off that so quick as soon as that acquisition came in from from uh, Paramount to Disney. Jesus. Yeah. So it's all garbage. Maybe 2024 will be better. There's a lot of great directors returning in 2024. I think my camera just went out here. Uh, if I'm frozen for you currently, that yep, is why. Right. Let's just transition <laughs> right over to the backup cam. There we go. Okay, it's a different shade of red. But that's all right. Uh, this show is just about over anyway. What's your most anticipated movie of 2024? Oh, let's start with yours, because I don't even know what's coming up. This year. Yes, that's right. There's uh, a lot of sequel. Uh, we've got um, Top Gun 3. I didn't see the last one. Thanksgiving 2. Beetlejuice 2. Karate Kid. That's a, that, they're merging the Karate Kid franchises with that. They're bringing in Ralph Macchio and Jackie Chan. What is he going to be training Will Smith's son? Mm -hmm. But now he's Ralph Macchio doing it. Uh, there's a Mean Girls musical coming out. That should be exciting. Uh, Dune. Dune 2. I don't... Uh, Ghostbusters, Godzilla, Ministry of Anja... I don't know. Challengers nothing god fuck I, I hate movies even that furiosa movie from george miller kind of looks like looks like shit. Um, it looks it doesn't have the same sort of charm that the last one did because now they're using more computer generated effects but you know what that's okay because 2024 what's going to be the best movie of the asset year? letter that's yeah that's right we've been saying it for three yeah. years now what's going to be the <laughs> what's going to be the best movie this year coming up mass state lottery but this time why am I looking at this camera instead? This time, I mean it. I mean it this yeah. time. I swear, guys. If I if I if I'm lying, I'll do uh, what was it? The Pain Olympics, where the guy like put a bunch of nails in his balls. I'll do that. I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. Cutting board, little knife. Little well, hold penis. on. I said nails. Oh. I didn't say cutting <laughs> board. No, no, we're not going that far. But I'll get the I'll get the bowling ball. I'll do something. Okay. I'll hold you to that somehow from, from from afar. I don't know. I don't know how I would do that, but yeah. Oh, Nosferatu. That sounds good. I like the Nosferatu story, and Robert Eggers is good. How about Robert Davi's Nosferatu? Sonic 3. There's a Lord of the Rings movie coming out in 2024. Oh, really? Oh, it's an animated prequel. Never mind. Uh, uh, Gladiator 2. That's another Ridley right. Scott. He is not stopping... For a second, I feel maybe he must feel death around the corner. And that's why he's making up to two movies a year. This Ridley Scott. I'm interested to see what Tim Burton does with that Beetlejuice movie just because he's bringing the original cast. I'm not expecting much, especially because of his recent work. Yeah, no, uh, I'm looking forward to some more interested independent movies that I don't know about or haven't been announced yet that pop out of nowhere on YTS and. I end up enjoying more than all of these big movies that just seem boring and creative, lacking cre creativity. Oh, you just remembered? I just oh, remembered. Right? So he, actually, here, here's the thing. I got the eye patch. This is upside down, I think. I got yep. a pack of eye patches because my eye was seriously bothering me. And I was like, you know what? And now the camera's dead, so I can't even get full benefit of it. But I was going to come on and wear an eye patch anyway, just for the fuck of it, because I have these now. But what I realized is that I can't even concentrate with this thing on. I can't. I can't see straight because again, this is this is the bad eye. This is my strong eye. And I'm just gonna cover that up. I can't do that. I'm just gonna be distracted the whole time and just like it feels like when you're like toying with a with a cat or something. Like you put the cat's ears down and the cat's whole like dynamic of yeah. time and space is thrown off. Well, if you cut. If you cut the whiskers and they can't even walk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you fuck with the whiskers <laughs> on the cat. Yes. Yeah. I've never cut a cat's whiskers off. No. I would never do such a thing, but that's I'm sure horrible. people have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a Planet of the Apes movie that's probably going to be shit like the other ones. I'm sorry. I hate that. I hate that franchise. I love the original ones. I hate the recent ones. There's a Twisters movie coming out. There's a Eli Roth's Borderlands movie. Fuck. Fuck. There's I've, I've heard that movie. movie total disaster and he has no control over the edit that they went back and reshot a bunch without him 
I've heard nothing but horror stories regarding that Borderlands movie. I mean, it's a movie starring Kevin Hart, Bobby Lee, Edgar Ramirez, Jack Black. They're trying to do Jumanji so, uh, with Borderlands? I guess. Uh, another Alien movie. Um, a Venom sequel. This is all the, the blockbuster movies. The, yeah. So the, we, don't, the, we don't know yet what the, the indie field or anything like that is going to show itself to be later in the year i have a feeling this year is going to be a good one for movies that's my that's my i hope so so that i can have more than five for my end of the year list i I think i have two years in a row with just top fives Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. but i mean i i think it's improved every single year 2020 obviously terrible 2021 much better 2022 better than 2021 2023 i would say is better than 2022 so We'll see what 2024 brings, aside from Mass State Lottery. And um, hopefully it's a good crop of movies that we'll be talking about. In the meantime, since we don't really have anything new to talk about, we're going to be doing some themed shows coming up. So go over to patreon.com slash lowres and sign up in the $5 tier to get access to those when they drop a hell of a lot sooner than anybody else. And again, all video episodes are exclusive to patreon.com slash lowres. There's going to be a clip there where we're also discussing the new discourse that this show has caused around the movie Past Lives. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Hans, thank you for joining me for yet another year of movies, counting down. Do you have any final words for the show? Um, Movies. (laughs) Thank you for listening.